Welcome back to another segment of Behind the Scenes of the Waltons. Today, I'm going to be attempting to answer some of your questions, some questions that I wasn't sure about the answers about. So I have um, my good friend, John Dayton, who was a production assistant on the Waltons, joining me so I can ask him some of these questions. So maybe between the two of us, we will be able to answer them. So please welcome John Dayton. Hi, Judy. John. Thank you so much for coming back to join me for another segment so I can ask you all the questions that I can yeah. think of that people ask me that I go, I have no idea. You may not know either, but at least people will know that I tried. <laughs> <laughs> and that I tried too. I know. I thank you for having me. Yeah, it's a privilege. It oh, really is. Always a pleasure. Um, I want to start with a question that I've been asked a number of times that I can't answer at all, which is about music. Music. Because I was not around, most of it was post-production. And even when we did things that were where we sang on screen, I, I sort of remember things when we were supposed to sing in church that there'd be some sort of playback that would come in and they'd play it a number of times and we'd right. kind of sing along and until we kind of knew it and then, and then we'd do it. Um, and I know John Walmsley, sometimes he sang live and sometimes it was pre-recorded. Um, so that aspect, but then all of what um, Sandy Courage did, all of the, that fabulous music throughout some- Yeah, that was years. all Sandy. And yeah. wasn't it Goldsmith, I believe? Jerry Goldsmith did our, our theme song. But yeah. I don't think he ever worked on the series. Oh, no. Yeah. But he was pretty famous. Yeah. <laughs> like the best. And, and if you look at Sandy Courage's credits, they're phenomenal. They're just absolutely phenomenal. There was, I saw something, an interview about the music one time on YouTube at where I think he was being interviewed about it. People always want to know if there's like, isn't there an album, a CD of the music from the Waltons because it was so good. And Not that there I'm never aware. was. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it all was... of that would be just created in post-production, right? Well, yeah. yeah. Um, for example, John um, would record a track. You know, we weren't even in stereo. We were, we were analog, magnetic strips. Um, if you remember Bill Flannery, he had a reel to reel. Uh, was just, a sound editor, right? Who well, recorded all the sound on set. On take. If, um, prior to that was wire recorders. You ever seen one of those? They're, they're fascinating. They're reels of copper. Wire recorders were used until the tape recorder was perfected. Now, the playback, which the company resisted because it was so expensive. Mm. You know, you had all that equipment to bring down to the set and additional people to, you know, take care of it technically. Um, there was an episode called uh, Founder's Day. And that's the episode that I played Jason's friend who played the piano. And so what, what happened to me was our camera operator, Joel, I said, please, they were set up behind me for one of the setups. Please don't show my fingers because I have no idea when I'm playing on the piano because Clay would not provide, Claylene would not provide the money to do a playback. And so when I saw the dailies, oh, you see the entire keyboard. And then when she chose the music, every one of them, I was playing down to, to the low notes, maybe <laughs> the high ones. And oh my God, it was hilarious. People ask me if um, in, I think it was spring fever, but I'm not positive. Maybe that wasn't it. But there, um, when the little boy played the trumpet. <laughs> And I'm always being asked if he really played trumpet. And 
I that I don't know. Yeah, I my I'm guess would be he, he didn't because it was very unusual. That's what I was gonna say. I, my my best guess would be that uh, that was to playback. Yeah, somebody else recorded it and then. You know, yeah, because in casting, your first priority is going to be the acting in a show like ours. So, um, and this happens in all kinds of shows. Um, I even see it in, in dance shows. Sometimes, you know, there are some people who really dance and then there's that <laughs> lead. That, and it always astonishes me how brilliantly they can edit to make it look like somebody who really doesn't dance. Dances. Makes it enough <laughs> and, you know, and they make it look like the person can. And you know, but I'm sure people who really are like ballerinas can go, oh, no, no. no, no. <laughs> so I, I don't know what kind of light we can shed on the music for people other than it was brilliantly. I mean, they he would bring in, I'm guessing at that point, live musicians to record. Yes. Yeah. There wasn't mm -hmm. all of the ability to use keyboards to produce all of that. So he'd yeah. have to have a whole old fashioned way. And don't forget, this was, I mean, we were shooting on film, 35 millimeter, and it was a magnetic strip that we first put the um, uh, sound on. So literally, there was no way to correct, uh, you know, jets going over and hisses, no way to compress the sound until Dolby. And we never had Dolby. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to change topics um, because I have been and I have been avoiding answering this question myself because all my years in film and television, I still cannot correctly define all the different producer titles. <laughs> oh, Judy. Well, yeah. I don't know if that there's that. I think they well, change. They do change, and and I was responsible for that on all of my Hepburn movies. Okay, you got an executive producer, producer, associate producer. That should be the end of it. It used to be producer, like Earl, uh, who was the creative one, uh, the production manager that took care of the money. A lot of people mistakenly believe that the producer finances the film. That's not true. The responsibility for the show goes on the producer. Executive producers, um, are they always the finance people? I mean, sometimes they're no. also... No, it's like me. Um, a CBS financed, um, Burt Reynolds Company, when I was there, financed, um, banks financed, um, it, it, it no the executive they, sometimes they bring the financing the executive producer they, yeah yeah i mean i have connections okay but now i'm talking television the buck stopped at me creatively that's what an executive producer should do you're responsible for that movie when it goes up on the screen if there's any problems and you didn't take care of them and they're out there, it's your fault. Or and with our company, Lee Rich and Merv Adelson, Merv didn't seem to be very involved. Yeah, Merv in didn't do, no, he didn't do anything credit. Yeah, I mean, writing. Creatively, no. Nothing creative. Nor did Lee. So what did Lee, Lee do? Lee did a little. Okay. Lee sold. So executive producers don't even always do the same thing from television show to television show to film. You were involved as an executive producer with the creative side of things, and yet Lee Rich wasn't really. And Merv Adelson Lee, wasn't, and yet they had both had executive producer credits. For example, Lee, um, after the Waltons, and Earl developed um, Falcon Crest, Lee went to New York, uh, along with um, Earl, took a meeting, Earl explained the concept, and Lee made the negotiations to sell it to the network. When he went into another office and left Earl alone and did, you know, did the selling, 
I'm sure there were some mentions of creative things, characters or whatever um, with Lee, but Lee would have then discussed it with Earl. And I can tell you, executive producers, there should only be one, unless it's a huge project. Um, they are responsible for what is on the screen. They have to prove everything. Now, uh, you know, 10 writers will sign on to a movie. And in negotiating with them, instead of paying them extra, they ask for a producer credit. And all those, and I see them now all the time, a list of maybe 10 or 12. Basically, they are writers who are getting the credit instead of an extra 35,000 bucks. So executive producer, producer then deals with um, what the, the day-to-day -day running of what goes exactly. on. Exactly. And an associate producer then. <laughs> Let's put it this way. The executive producer gets all the dirt. <laughs> the associate, uh, the producer gets a little bit less of it. The associate gets a, a lot of it. And um, they're way down the totem pole and they're probably not a producer. Think of it sometimes as a courtesy title <laughs> for various- a Courtesy, companies. but in our business, it's a negotiated courtesy. And then you mentioned production manager, which we had on the Waltons, and Mario, yeah. but I also, that's fairly interchangeable with a line producer it is. Days, isn't it? Okay. Yes. Who handles what? What would you say the line producer's responsibilities are? Or the production Budget. manager? The budgeting? Budgeting. Um, Keeping things being on the budget, set. Being the liaison between <laughs> being the, the, liaison. the director wanting to spend money and the producer's executive producer saying, no, we don't have that money to spend. Figure it out. Right. right. And that's the way it was on the Waltons because Let's just say the extra money for playback. Well, um, that was Lee's decision. However, Claylene Jones, who eventually got an associate producer credit, had to give us the bad news. <laughs> so she was the one that came down to the set and said, I'm sorry, you can't have the, you can't have the playback. So I'm going to be talking soon with Rachel Longacre, who played Amy Godsey. And the first episode that introduced her was The Great Motorcycle Race. Of course, David, David Harper, who played Jim Bob, you know, he was, he, his character, Jim Bob, built a motorcycle, built a car, you know, was working on it. And, and, I'm, and I'm in that, um, that episode. David was going to help. Yeah, I mean, clearly, I mean, he wasn't that old when we did that episode, and yet he had to have learned enough about riding yeah. a motorcycle. And I mean, I know he had a stunt double for the race. Oh, yeah, for the was, race, but not for the stuff in, in town. Yeah, and like in, there's a point where he's first riding it and he's doing circles in the front yard. And the way they're doing the shot, I mean, it's clearly him on it, but yeah. was it a camera car that had, that he was, I mean, how were they getting, because they were I like straight on forward and it didn't look like process, um, but there was a number of times and one I, time they were, he was going down the road and they literally like zoomed in on him. Okay. So it made me feel like it was maybe a camera car or something. It, it wasn't a special piece. <clears throat> this is my memory. Uh, uh, um, it was like the camera was on the back of a pickup. Okay. Um, no special equipment. Poor man's camera car. <laughs> yeah, poor man's yeah. camera car. It just made it seem like maybe he was attached, that they were somehow towing the motorcycle. I couldn't say for sure. I don't want to give out false information. Yeah. I know. I look at him and I go, well, I think this is what's happening, but 
It, it could have been handheld. It could have been the Panaflex handheld on the uh, with the operator sitting on the back of a pickup okay. truck. But something, but he was definitely moving. He would have had to be able to keep the motorcycle going. Oh, yeah, that's he, why he, I didn't know if they were towing it because it was so consistent. That's a possibility. In the shot. So it just felt like something that was being towed. Mm -hmm. that, that'd be possible. So and that, then added, that was my question when I was suddenly watching the motorcycle race um, episode. Um, and then I had a question about the episode, The Fire, with, um, when Ludi Bascom, Lori Prang's father, burns down, he's drunk and he, he burns down the schoolhouse because he doesn't like what Miss Fordwick is teaching about evolution. Uh, mm -hmm. And so somebody asked me, because I know most of the time, I always remember us shooting the interior of the schoolhouse actually in that set. In that church. In the church. So in this case, they burn down they burned down that church it's still there <laughs> yeah i know that so then there was somebody asked if there was a duplicate set i i <clears> thought <throat> we shot all that in there and they just somehow you know rigged that... the flames and fire to and then had like when they burned down the house and all of a sudden in the interior everything looks charred yeah you know honestly judy i don't remember of course, you and me I, both, I know. I'm sorry, lovely, I, loyal followers, but this is where we're I, at like 40, 50 years later. Well, yeah, 50 years ago. And plus, we moved. I think so this fast. is what happened. I'm in scenes. I'm like, I, I don't remember. I don't remember saying that. I remember doing it. And other things I recall vividly. <laughs> oh, and certainly we vividly recall burning the house. Yes. Because yes. a lot of us literally were in tears. It was yeah. so real. And then well, you and what's funny is that, of course, then after that episode, which people bring up that so much of the house is supposed to have burned. And yet when they when we rebuild, it's the same. Nothing, none of the furniture got burned <laughs> down. Funny. Nothing's <laughs> missing from the attic. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> Of that. But, but what <laughs> is so funny. Well, it's I magic. Know. It's the wall. It is magic. I want to thank John for joining me and helping to answer some of these questions. I don't know how well we did, but hopefully it was um, entertaining for you regardless. I will be back with more behind the scenes of the Waltons and more Ask Judy. Thanks for watching.